Villains are certainly a staple within storytelling. From Darth Vader to Satan himself, villains represent how we perceive evil. However, many writers today have rather childish views on good and evil. Readers are not immune to this either. The preference for a one-dimensional treatment of evil runs rampant in our world. When we are confronted with evil in reality, whether it's in others or in ourselves, we can't afford to take such a simplistic view. In this video, I will point out the many misconceptions writers and readers have about villains and evil in general. I will draw on various films, novels, plays and poems to establish a more complex view on evil. I'll also consider perspectives from psychologists, historians, philosophers, and even religion. To make this video more timely, I'll consider the influx of sympathetic villains from Disney, such as the recent Cruella movie. With the exception of the final season of Game of Thrones and William Shakespeare's play Macbeth, there are very little spoilers in this video. The literary works I discuss in depth include A Song of Ice and Fire by George R. R. Martin, Phantom of the Opera by Gaston Larocque, The Kindly Ones by Jonathan Little, Paradise Lost by John Milton, Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte, and various examples of Brexit literature. In the description box below, there's an excellent article by the critic about Brexit era fiction. I highly recommend checking it out as it gives more context to my points about Brexit literature. I'm making this video for three reasons. The first one is my belief that complex, well-drawn villains are superior, in most cases, than cardboard cutouts. The second reason why deals with contemporary discourse I see about villains and evil. I believe that something is broken and I frequently see childish perceptions on good and evil pushed on writers such as myself. The final reason why I am making this video is more philosophical and relates to the overall nature of good and evil. It's true, my understanding of evil differs to others but it's a perspective I don't see really discussed on social media. To clarify before I begin, there is certainly a time and a place for obviously evil characters. A great example is the short fiction of H.P. Lovecraft. The monsters in it have to be cosmically evil for H.P. Lovecraft to achieve his desired effect. Likewise, I don't really want a sad, teary story about how Pennywise the Dancing Clown is just a human being like the rest of us. It wouldn't work. Although I'm quite passionate about my argument, I am not saying my thesis fits to all examples of writing evil. Let's begin. I'm Madeline Rose Jones, and I help you understand the world through fiction. Subscribe for videos about history, literature, and culture. Before I begin, I want to mention my classes on Skillshare, which are all about creative writing and reading. If that interests you, check out the link below. I've just posted classes on using fear as a creative writer and outlining your first novel. I'm very passionate about helping creative writers reach the next level. With that said, let's get into the video. Argument 1. Complex villains break through ideology. While it's okay for writers to have their own perspectives and opinions, after all, who does not? I find it really hard to read a novel where the writer is clearly ideological. It's possible to write fiction with complexity and nuance, yet many writers use their personal ideologies to create cliches tired tropes and pointless political banter. A recent example of this 
is a trend of so-called Brexit literature in the United Kingdom. Many established writers were upset at Brexit. And you know what? Even though I may not share their sentiment, I understand creative writing is deeply personal and no topic should be off limits. However, the problem with a lot of books about Brexit is they aren't good. Even talented and award-winning writers such as Ian McEwan are not immune to this. His novella, The Cockroach, reads more like a rant than a careful meditation on British politics. Ian McEwan draws an analogy between Tory Prime Minister Boris Johnson to a cockroach. Some lines in the novel are not subtle and are clearly ideological and hyperbolic. By doing this, McEwan denies complexity to his topic. The simplistic portrayal of politics drags the novella down. More than that, many authors writing Brexit literature won't offer any empathy to those they despise. As said earlier, I've linked an article below about Brexit literature. Make sure you check it out. The Critic is truly a fantastic magazine about British culture. Anyway, empathy is crucial to writing great characters. Empathy results in the reader having a stronger connection with the character. It is not just heroes and main protagonists who require this connection. When villains seem cartoonish and simplistic, it is an obstacle for the reader to get fully invested in the story. Therefore, if you are writing Brexit literature, you need to empathise with both sides. You need to understand why Britain voted to leave the European Union, and that means empathising with the people of the United Kingdom. When it comes to political and contemporary fiction, you really can't afford to get lazy and cut corners. People will notice and they will not appreciate it. I'm going to take this argument in a controversial direction. Let's discuss Nazi Germany. I want to discuss the Third Reich because I see the same childish perceptions of evil in fiction applied to actual history. Now, World War II and Nazi Germany are well-worn topics in historical fiction and in the study of history. But if you want to be a successful storyteller or historian in writing about Nazism, you need empathy. And unfortunately for some, this means empathising with Nazis. This thought obviously scares a lot of writers and historians, and I get it. But there is one historian it obviously didn't scare. Christopher Browning, who wrote the fantastic book Ordinary Men. In this amazing work of non-fiction, Browning argues that a unit of German police in Poland were in fact ordinary men. Their actions, although horrific and monstrous, were influenced by factors universal to all of humanity. After reading Ordinary Men, the reader is faced with a sinking realisation that they too may have done the same thing. The implications of this are immense. If we are capable of such evil, then by that logic, they are capable of our goodness. This is precisely why I object to cartoonish depictions of Nazi Germany. It's not because of any political or ideological reason, it's because these depictions get humanity wrong. As the Nobel Prize winning author of the Gulag Archipelago, Alexander Solzhenitsyn said, If only it were all so simple. If only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds and it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil 
cuts through the heart of every human being. And who is willing to destroy a piece of their own heart? The best historiography and fiction about World War II isn't afraid to ask difficult questions. Even literature and film inspired by World War II, such as Star Wars, should also follow this. When the sequel trilogy was released, I remember all the discourse about General Hux. Much of the audience took pleasure out of Hux being the comedic relief and so one-dimensional. The rationale behind this was the conclusion that Nazis, too, were also comedic and one-dimensional. This is rather disappointing because it's nothing the audience hasn't seen before in Marvel movies and other franchises. And the writing of Hux was lazy in many occasions. That's also why I'm making this video. When you have a villain representing an ideology, and they are so cartoonish, you are not making a sophisticated argument against said ideology. You are just creating a straw man. An author who thankfully avoids this is Jonathan Little, who in 2006 wrote the French novel The Kindly Ones. In it, we follow Dr. Maximilian Au as he participates in Nazi atrocities. It's a big, chunky book, longer than most historical fiction. It's also bleak, horrific, and morally troublesome. The author does such a great job in immersing you in Max's shoes that you both understand and deplore his actions. This is effective writing and it should be encouraged. Unfortunately, many writers and readers are afraid of humanising Nazis or whitewashing the Holocaust. To that, I'd say that such fears poison good storytelling and weaken your creative writing. More than that, they punish humanity's desire to further understand themselves. Great villains don't just make the hero uncomfortable, they unsettle the reader in the real world as well. Fiction and art are not meant to make us comfortable or to tell us lies. Empathy and complex characters are great ways for us to understand the darker sides within us and to help us spot the light. By the way, I highly recommend The Kindly Ones if you have the stomach for it. It's terrific and perfect for fans of Michelle Hulebeck. Part 2. Literature ought to be challenging. In the first part, I stressed the importance of nuanced villains and highlighted the many benefits of complex characters. I used World War II and Nazi Germany as examples, but now I want to go further back in history to early modern England. There are two literary works I will discuss here, Macbeth, the play by William Shakespeare, and Paradise Lost, the epic poem by John Milton. Both are truly terrific to read, and if you struggle with early modern English like I did, it's best to use an edition that comes with notes and references. But they also serve a point I want to make. Literature and art are meant to be confronting and challenging. Often I see a presumption from many readers that all fiction is escapism and has no deeper meaning. This is a viewpoint that I can't share. Although fiction is made up, it has a possibility to exaggerate, distort, amplify and analyse our own real lives. Sometimes it's okay to turn to fiction for escapism and light entertainment, but we shouldn't fool ourselves that it's the sole and only purpose of fiction. And no one illustrates this point better than William Shakespeare. His tragedies, whether it's Othello, Romeo and Juliet, Hamlet or Macbeth, dramatise the life and downfall of individuals. As we are discussing theatre, we must remember the intention for his plays to be said out loud in front of an audience. 
On a surface, superficial level, we have nothing in common with Shakespeare's tragedies. Unlike Romeo and Juliet, our first love didn't or won't end in suicide. Unlike Macbeth, we don't kill our allies or friends. But, like Romeo and Juliet, we feel the agony and torment from loss and grief. Like Macbeth, we too can seek power. Villains and heroes have always been exaggerated forms of human nature. Even the devil himself is an exaggeration. In Paradise Lost, Satan's war is closely connected to Adam and Eve's rejection of God's command. The devil is not just an evil cartoon villain. He is a fully realised character who, regardless of our own theology, could exist. John Milton makes this an uncomfortable notion, one both disturbing and tragic. But Milton's brilliance isn't just limited to his portrayal of Satan. In Paradise Lost, he delivers complex thoughts and ideas on knowledge, the nature of God, human responsibility and sin. I'd argue that the fantastic portrayal of Satan helps the other elements of this poem. When fiction has a badly written villain, it tends to drag the whole work down. Writers who offer complexity to loathsome characters will offer it to every aspect of their writing. My edition of Paradise Lost has an interesting blurb. A critic calls Satan literature's first romantic. For those unfamiliar with romanticism, it is a key intellectual and artistic movement from the late 1700s. John Milton is clever, as Satan is not just a cosmic evil entity, but someone whose fate is linked with mankind. If this part interests you, I highly recommend checking out the writings of cultural critic and academic Camille Paglia. She perceives the great religions of humanity, such as Christianity, as epic works of art. Not only that, but she builds on Solzhenitsyn's thesis about good and evil being present in every man's heart. Even if you are not religious, you can still interpret the Bible or the development of Christianity through the lenses of art. Out of all the arguments Alexander Solzhenitsyn, Camille Paglia, and even Jordan Peterson make, the most alluring one is that humanity can't escape fully from good or evil. If you've ever read Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky, you'll understand this too. Of course, the implications of this is utterly challenging. Understanding our capacity for good and evil is hard. That's why I push for nuanced and complex villains. They can explore this notion and remind us that we too can go horribly wrong. Part three, the limitations of pigeon holding villains into categories. Remember season eight of Game of Thrones where beloved Daenerys Targaryen committed an atrocity and would have continued if she wasn't killed. This is clearly a controversial moment in television history. On one hand, you have fans who cast all of Daenerys' actions before season 8 as good or evil. I've seen this myself because I fell for it too. The idea that if someone does something so evil that all their previous actions are now automatically evil is not new. But I find the flip side to be incorrect as well. Another section of Game of Thrones fans dismiss any possibility ever had the capacity for monstrous actions. As established earlier, Daenerys has both the capacity of good and evil. One doesn't wash the other out. It is entirely possible for some of Daenerys' actions to be good, others evil, and most in between. 
Likewise, when we apply this principle to ourselves, we must admit our own actions being either good, bad or somewhere in between. This may sound like a simple point, but I don't think people are born as solely good or evil. Of course, there are characters who will lean to one extreme. Cersei Lannister is a terrific example. Her evil actions, which there are many, are a mixture of psychological and environmental factors. If anything, her position as a Lannister, daughter of Tywin, having wealth and many personal grudges, contribute more to her behaviour than being born evil. I remember being heavily involved in the Game of Thrones and A Song of Ice and Fire fandom when the TV show was on. When Cersei was portrayed in a sympathetic way, I, sadly to my embarrassment, got very angry. Game of Thrones has Cersei committing absolutely horrific, undeniable actions of evil. But she also has moments of sympathy and love. Of course I hated this. It made hating Cersei more difficult and complex. But looking back, those moments where Cersei is human and understandable are actually very important. They make her more tragic and horrific and scary at the same time. That said, from a storytelling perspective, sometimes you need characters who are just evil for the sake of it. The clearly psychotic Ramsay Bolton is proof of this, but he is an exception. Most Game of Thrones characters are nuanced and complex in regards to morality. My two favourite characters are Sansa and Arya Stark, and while they are certainly heroic, that doesn't mean I like everything they do. I see this fear among my fellow writers. They are scared to write heroes in an unsympathetic way, or villains in a sympathetic way. This probably explains the flaw in Cruella and other Disney adaptations. The writers believe the only way to make villainous characters likeable or sympathetic is by justifying their actions. After all, no one can blame Maleficent for her actions in the recent Disney version. This is a shame because a person can certainly be likeable, interesting and sympathetic while still being very wrong. Disney writers are so caught up on explaining a villain's actions and motives that they forget the reason why the original animated films were so beloved. In much of fairy tales and children's literature, the writers exaggerate and amplify certain situations and characters. Cruella de Vil, for example, is over the top and cartoonish, and that fits the tone of the story. That's why not every villain should be complex, sympathetic, or even nuanced. Much of the backlash against multi-dimensional portrayals of evil and villains stems from poor attempts at characterization. Part four, what we have in common with villains. As said in previous parts, we have plenty in common with villains. But let's take this train of thought further and ask ourselves, what does it mean to share the same universal tendencies and traits as a villain? We can simply look to Gothic literature for examples. Both Wuthering Heights and Phantom of the Opera have tragic villains in Heathcliff and in Eric. What Gaston Laroques and Emily Bronte do very well is get the reader invested in their tragic lives and the downfalls they experience. The result of this is quite powerful. We are reminded that we too can fall. An important point to make about storytelling and one I've mentioned earlier, is how fiction exaggerates reality. Although our actions may never be as villainous as Heathcliff's, Eric's or anyone else mentioned in this video, we can still view such characters as ultimate extensions of ourselves. Therefore, a mistake many writers make 
when writing villains is forgetting what humanity has in common with them. The best dramatic works make the most of this tension and explore both the human side and villains and the villainous side in humanity. I'd like to now include some tips for creative writers who are interested in developing their villains further. My first tip is clear. Add depth to your villain. Make them human and don't worry too much about likeable or loathsome traits. Some writers try way too hard to make a villain likeable, whilst others just pile on the nastiness. If they have well-developed motives, they are better characters for it. Consider what your villain wants and the actions they'll take in achieving said goals. And please, please, do not reduce your villain down to an ideology, caricature or cliché. Humans are more than their beliefs. But my most important writing advice is to defend your decisions. Whatever direction you take your villain in, it may result in anger and even offend some readers. That's not the end of the world and it's okay for you to stand by your work. I hope you enjoyed this video and make sure you comment below with any thoughts. If you like, you can share this content via email or social media. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.